This time on STV, we got four segments between commercial breaks and each one of them is gonna be different. Think of it as an STV buffet. So if you don't like what you're watching, stick around till after the break because it's gonna be something completely new. STV is brought to you by Yamaha, revs your heart. 509, fueling your passion. And by Polaris, think outside. Yamaha's LTX with power steering, of course, it's got the turbo, it's got the 137 inch track, and let's hit the trails. I never met a snowmobile I didn't love, and I love this one, that's for sure. All right, here we go. So this one's got all the Sidewinder goodies to it. It's got heated seats, it's got turbocharged power, it's got IQS shocks, manually adjustable, not the adjust on the fly ones, but, uh, but these ones are also rebound adjustable as well, so that's a little bit more adjustability there, and it's really a nice package. And I mean, this thing, not a lot new for Yamaha in 2024, but they keep coming to the party with refinements to make stuff better every year, and Yamaha Faithful, you know, this will be another one of your go-to favorite sleds. Haven't spent a ton of time on it yet, but I mean, it's got all the Yamaha feel to it with the Genesis motor. And I mean, just legs for days. With the 137 inch track, I mean, it is a little long sometimes for a trail sled, but I mean, you need that 137 inch track to get the bite. Otherwise, you're just blowing it all out under the snow flap. There's just so much power with these Genesis motors that you need that extra track length. And it does a very good job of bridging the bumps and just creating a really nice ride. And of course, again, legs for days on these things. Now one of the things I like about this trim package, it gets you the IQS shocks. And these shocks are, I think, some of my favorite in the business. Especially with the rebound damping, it does add a little complexity, but overall, they are a very simple shock absorber to tune to your riding style and conditions. Three positions on the top button, and each position makes a huge difference in the feel of the sled and the seat of the pants. So, you know if you want to soften it up, you know, one or two clicks if you're on full firm, or go the other way, one or two clicks, and you can feel it immediately and how the sled is reacting going down the trail. And you can harshen it up if you got those big sucker bumps where you're gonna be you know, riding moguls at the end of a weekend. But if you wanna soften it down when the trails are like they are today here in West Yellowstone, we got like a foot of snow so the trails are soft. Soften the suspension right up and this thing is just butter smooth on these trails. And it's got speed but I think we know that by now that the Yamaha Sidewinder is a sled that has all kinds of speed to it you know what I can feel yeah I can feel the heated seat coming through it's not the heated seats on these things it's not like a, a car where it really gets warm obviously you got nothing on your back but it does you feel a little bit coming through at the bottom there just sort of takes a little bit of the edge off. Nice. Now I should also talk on this sled, this one has power steering. That's the other thing you get with this package is power steering. And I'll say it again, when I first saw power steering on a sled, which goes back a number of years ago now with the Apex, I thought what a ridiculous thing to throw on a snowmobile. But the more you ride a sled with power steering, especially one that let's face it is a little bit bigger a little bit heavier on the front end like these sidewinders are that power steering just does an absolute 
excellent job of making the sled feel a lot lighter. And it's progressive too, so as your speed goes up, it, does, it doesn't make the bars go numb in your hand. You always got that feel of what the sled is doing underneath you. It's, it's not like it just sort of divorces you from the ride experience. And of course, when you're slowing down, we got a stop sign. I mean, it's just so easy to, to turn. Like, I got one hand on it and just so easy. I can see myself putting a lot of miles on this sled. So good. I didn't know it at the time when I was riding the LTX that this sled is going to be the pinnacle of this model. And that's because we all know now that Yamaha is going to cease production of snowmobiles after model year 2025. And knowing that information kind of changes how you evaluate not only the LTX, but all of Yamaha sleds. Over the last few years, it seems like the whole snowmobile community, both inside and outside the Yamaha Lovers Club, have been becoming increasingly critical of the lack of development for the Yamaha lineup. Big things like the chassis, styling and technology have all been falling behind as other manufacturers have been pushing hard on all these fronts. I know I've been critical in the past of things like the gauge, which is and it's unlikely to change from model year 25, the last year of production for Yamaha. Likewise, I don't suspect there's gonna be any suspension changes and obviously no new chassis despite really hoping for a blue catalyst. Across the lineup, the SRV chassis is in its sunset and just about to dip below the horizon. But throughout all the years of production, the team at Yamaha and Articat have made constant improvements to these sleds, most of which have been beneath the skin as they resolved durability issues and made other tweaks to the chassis and suspension focusing on optimizing everything they could throughout the life cycle of the chassis. And what we're left with is one heck of a snowmobile, 200-ish horsepower at sea level, making it blisteringly fast. And we have one of the best suspensions on the snow with the Fox QS3 shocks that are simple to understand and make changes to that you can instantly feel. Plus, we have a great looking sled on the snow. There is just something about blue bodywork on a white background that just looks so good. and the ride experience is as good as it looks. The chassis is a comfortable place to be for both long and short rides, but I do find you have to put some effort in. But if you're willing to do the work, this sled is as fast as any other on the snow when needed. Also, it's super docile when the pace mellows out. It always amazes me how a sled with 200 horsepower can putt-putt around all day long on a family-type ride where the speeds never reach the posted limit and it doesn't care. This sled won't foul up. It has a light throttle for smaller hands. The clutch engagement is buttery smooth. The suspension is supple, all making this sled an easy one to ride. Then at the end of the day, without missing a beat, you can rip this machine across the lake for a pass better than 100 miles an hour. I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time on Yamaha sleds like this LTX over the years with STV. And thinking back, they've left me with so many good memories and experiences I wouldn't know where to start in telling these stories. So for right now, I'm forgetting about stuff like the terrible gauge and just accepting it for what it is. And once you do that, you strip away all your expectations and are left with the enjoyment of what is a great snowmobile. I'm still unhappy about Yamaha leaving the industry, but at least they're leaving us with sleds like this. Coming up after the break, we got gas. This segment is brought to you by Polaris. The landscape is changing when it comes to what's powering our vehicles. Now, electric is obviously one of the ways the industries are going, and we see this over the road with electric cars and trucks. And then in the off-road and the power sports industry, we now have electric snowmobiles, ATVs, and motorcycles, and frankly, some of them are quite good.
Now, I don't want to get into the debate about how government mandates are influencing the choices manufacturers and consumers are making. Instead, let's simply agree that times are changing both now and in the future. And I wanted to focus on the present, because the gasoline that we consume in our vehicles, especially our vintage vehicles, well, it's changing right now. Depending on where you live, both in Canada and the US, ethanol blended fuels are becoming the norm and non-ethanol blends have either disappeared or are disappearing. I was lucky. Typically in my area, the 91 octane rated fuel was non-ethanol, but that's changing. For new vehicles, this isn't an issue. Modern fuel systems are designed to cope with ethanol in the fuel, but older vehicles like these are not, and ethanol fuels can be a real problem. To learn more about how the fuel industry is changing and some of the problems we're facing, we've invited Derek May into the shop to talk to us about what we can do as vintage iron enthusiasts. I'm seeing, you know, with older sleds, and it doesn't even really have to be that old, even into the early 2000s, um, some of those fuel systems, especially ones that had carburetors in them, correct, weren't necessarily designed for an E10 or the ethanol blends that we see now. Exactly. You'll get that gum in them. Uh, you'll see hoses breaking, some seals cracking. And it's just, in a lot of cases with rubber and alcohol, ethanol, you'll see a, a drying out of it. You see it when you get a alcohol on your hand, when you get a cut. Your skin dries out, the same with rubber. Yeah, and it'll degrade plastic to the point where it'll actually crack and, yep. and snap. Um, I've seen rubber hoses in the past with older ATVs and power sports equipment where that hose literally turns to jelly in your hands and it's terrible stuff to get off. Yes. And then, of course, with old snowmobiles, uh, same thing and, and plug carburetors and growth and corrosion and corruption in there yeah. and there's nothing we can do about it, right? Yeah, even floats becoming brittle and starting to break apart. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about the fuel itself. So what are some of the ways that you have found or suggested to your customers that what they can do to help slow down the, the problems that we're having with ethanol fuel, especially when we're dealing with older sleds? So the biggest thing with ethanol is uh, A, the alcohol content, and then B, the water absorption. Uh, what we've found is people, and it really it only happens when it's stored. If you're using it all the time and you're running the fuel through, you're not going to be running into those issues. Mm -hmm. It's when you know you put your sled away in the spring and you go to fire it up in the fall. So what we've suggested for a lot of people, drain as much fuel out of your system as you can, find an ethanol free source even, mm -hmm. um, even if it's the small cans of ethanol free fuel that you can find at hardware stores or fuel distributors, and run that through before you store it and that'll help immensely. If you can't do that, fuel stabilizers definitely help. Mm -hmm. Why do some of the problems arise with ethanol? Um, we talked earlier about it being hydroscopic and pulling in water from the atmosphere. So explain that to me again. So it'll pull in water from the atmosphere, from condensation, uh, from anywhere it can, but it'll hit a saturation point where all of a sudden you'll start to get phase separation to the point where you'll actually see water below the fuel. And you were saying that hydroscopic effect of the ethanol will pull that water in from the atmosphere, precipitate it out as this phase separation, but continue to build that. So you can end up with quite a bit of water in the bottom of your fuel tank or even in the bottom of a carburetor, I suppose. Exactly. Um, and once you start to, say you run a tank low enough on it and you start to pull water. That can get interesting and can lead to leaned out engines. So that's exactly. Seized engines, especially with uh, like carbed triple cylinder Polarises. Ask me how I know that. Center piston. Center piston, yep. Actually, I think I did all three at once. It was a good nice. shot of water that <laughs> came in there. <laughs> but that was with my old 650. The, the silver lining about that, it was I was able to bore it 60 over after that because I had no choice. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Now, this also goes well beyond snowmobiles. I mean, people should be thinking about this if they've got older generators, older motorcycles, race cars, yep. um, all of this stuff is something that has to be thought about now as ethanol is becoming ever increasing in our fuel. But there's no magic potion that we can put in to neutralize the ethanol. So again, exactly. we have to live with it. We have to do things to our fuel system to we be able to, to prevent problems, adapt, good point. Now, of course, I'm not real happy about these new realities when it comes to fueling our vintage vehicles, but on a recent road trip down to the States, I did find non-ethanol rated pumps right next to ethanol blended fuels. 
And then of course, in the off-road, there's race gas that's available as non-ethanol. So there's going to be options out there, but there's definitely a premium to pay for fuel like this. Moving forward for all of us with vintage iron, where updating the fuel system to accept ethanol in the fuels just isn't possible. What to do with that ethanol in the fuel is something we're gonna have to think about, especially when vehicles are gonna be stored for a long period of time. I know I'm definitely gonna change the way I put my old stuff to bed. Coming up right after this, we'll really have something to chatter about. This segment is brought to you by Yamaha. Helmet communicators are nothing new, but like with all tech, they keep getting better with age. Gone are the days of voice tubes and a range about as far as you could fire that communicator into the bush. Today's devices integrate seamlessly with the rest of your tech and definitely elevate the snowmobiling experience. I've been wearing communications devices for a few years now and it's changed snowmobiling for me. First, when it comes to doing the day-to-day -day work of STV, the ability to talk with the cameraman as we travel down the trail or in the backcountry has made our days much more efficient. Then being able to listen to music, especially stuff that matches the pace of the ride, just makes the experience in your head better. Plus, I wouldn't have believed it if it hadn't happened to me, but you can make a phone call where the people on the other end of the line have no idea your head is in a helmet and you're traveling down the trail on a snowmobile at a pretty good pace. Now, this fact has definitely upped my game when it comes to playing hooky from work. Over the last few years, I've been using devices like these chatterbox units that are retrofitted into any existing helmet. Installation is easy. The head unit is clamped to the side of the helmet, so no holes need to be drilled. Then there's a mic that's run to a location in front of your mouth and a set of speakers that are installed by your ears. The toughest part of the installation, which really isn't that tough, is cleanly routing the wires from the head unit into the interior of the helmet. Start to finish, it'll take about a half hour for the first time you install a system like the Chatterbox and about 15 minutes for all the rest of the installs, which is not bad. Plus, these systems are easily removable to be able to move them to other helmets for use in other seasons. Now, as easy as these Chatterbox units are to install, 509 has taken it to a whole new level with their comm system integrated right into the shell of the helmet. <music> 509 has included the Cardo device in their Delta Commander series of helmets. These are full-faced units that are designed for long-distance rides at cold temperatures. Now, in addition to the comms unit, this carbon model has an electric heated shield and rear-facing chase light. Plus, there's Venturi tunnels located on each side of the helmet to extract moisture from your breath, helping to keep the visor fog-free. But the real story is the comm system embedded right into the shell of the helmet and mic and speaker systems on the inside. Now, this design is way more sleek and stealthy looking than a retrofitted unit clamped to the side. On the left side are all the controls for the comm system, which also accepts voice commands for most functions like when it comes to answering a phone call or listening to music. The voice command will also do things like adjust the volume up and down. On the right side is the main power for the system and auxiliary controls to run the visor on and off, as well as the red light on the back of the helmet. The internal JBL speakers are also noise cancelling to quiet the ride and to provide a better sound to the rider, helping you carry on conversations to your phone or up to 15 other riders in your group. Plus, the system offers even more customization and controls through the app you can download to your smart device. Helmet comms are easy to use and easy to install, and once you give them a try, you're never going to go back to the old-fashioned way of snowmobiling. Coming up next, we've got one more little story for you. This segment is brought to you by 509. So somewhere around here, there's a wheel horse that I've been trying to spy because I haven't seen one of those in a long time. There's a, no, oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay, okay get, yeah, getting closer. Here it is. Wow, it's a little smaller than I thought it was going to be. 
Wow, that's that's really small. How am I supposed to ride that? Wow. So obviously this is a little smaller than one you're going to ride, and I'm with that's Essen, right. who's designed this. Now, Essen, take me through what this model actually is, because sure, it's, that's it's pretty unique. Yeah, this is uh, actually a 1970 wheel horse snowmobile uh, scaled down to 125th scale. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is try to put every detail of the real thing in it. Uh, every piece the real one would have. Can I see it again? Um, sure. Because, yeah, I mean, the detail in it is amazing because if you look inside the cowl, you can actually Actu see the engine, there's the jack shaft and... Yep, and the carburetors in there, the fuel lines, yeah. the spark plug wires. We, we it, actually, it's every crazy. single part, every piece. And you said your company started doing like uh, small scale tractors. Yeah, what we started doing was uh, garden tractors. And this was a kind of a way to get into the vintage snowmobile um, scene with uh, kind of the tractor feel to it. Yeah, no, that's... So being wheel horse. Like that is that, amazing. So. Yeah, and what we do is is we uh, take the, a real snowmobile or tractor out of my collection and uh, reverse engineer every single piece of it. Yeah, you um, measure everything? Try, yeah. Measure every single piece, uh, scale it down, uh, design it in SolidWorks, yeah. and then, then some parts are laser 3D printed, some are, some are molded, some are cast, and uh, just to, to get the final product there. And Very yeah. intricate work. Now, if somebody wanted to check this out online, where would sure. they go? Um, we are on Facebook right now uh, at Esten's Hobbies and Restorations. Very cool. So this show is a little bit all over the place, but so are the snow and trail conditions outside. For me, sitting here in the shop early in January 2024, I've been doing more riding on the internet than I have actually on snowmobiles, and I'm really hoping that's going to change soon. But one thing's for certain, deadlines don't stop for STV. And we'll have another show for you next week. See you then. Closed captioning is brought to you by Scott Snowmobile Goggles. STV has been brought to you by Best Western Hotels and Resorts. Wherever life takes you, Best Western is there. Ultimax Belts, performance driven, performance proven. And by Ford F-Series, Canada's best selling line of pickup trucks for 58 years.